This is The Joe Gaither Show on BamaCentral.com. Good afternoon, Tuscaloosa, Internet World, West Alabama. How are we doing today on a Thursday? Welcome in. This is the Joe Gaither Show on Bama Central and BamaCentral.com. We are the Alabama Crimson Tide on SI, powered by Bama Central. And we want to thank everybody for giving us a couple days off. I had a little vacation driving up to Chicago, enjoying a couple days up there. So, no show on Wednesday or Thursday, but we are locked in and ready for football season now. So, very, very exciting. Next week, the Alabama Crimson Tide checks in to report to fall camp. And uh, it'll be, it'll be, we're one week away, basically. Uh, first practice, I believe, is the 31st. So, less than one w- week away from the Alabama Crimson Tide reporting for camp and getting fall camp underway. So, we are locked into football season. We're going to start hammering these shows out pretty much daily from now until the end of football season, talking all things Crimson Tide. We invite you guys to jump in and join us on the Bama Central YouTube channel at Bama Central, on my own social media machines at Joe Gaither 6 for your favorite social media machine, whether it be Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. And you can always find us on your favorite pla- podcast platform on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or on Amazon. Make sure you download, rate, review, subscribe to the show. You can send me your comment, question, query, or complaint as well right there to Joe Gaither 6 on your favorite social media machine. What are we going to do today? It's Thursday. we got a couple more days until fall camp actually gets started. So we'll knock out some more of our off-season topics. I will be presenting two of the interviews that I did last week in Dallas. We'll be talking to Ryan Chapman from Oklahoma Sooners on SI. And we'll be talking to Kirk Bowles from the Houston Chronicle. We remember Kirk Bowles joined us last year for the Alabama-Texas game. And it was great to catch up with him as well as meeting Ryan Chapman for the first time out there in Dallas as we welcome Texas and Oklahoma into the conference. What will we do in between? In between, we will build off the two conversations that we're having with Ryan and Kirk by talking about rivalries in the SEC. I've written a list of top 10 rivalries in the SEC. You guys can let me know your top 10 rivalries now in the SEC with Oklahoma and Texas joining the conference. I added a couple Oklahoma and Texas rivalries to my list, uh, and I've got them ranked out one through 10. And then what we will also do is talk about Lincoln Riley. Yeah, Lincoln Riley had Alabama's name, had Nick Saban's name in his mouth yesterday at Big Ten Media Days. And while I was on the road, totally checked out, I get back to Tuscaloosa about 1 a.m. last night, and I'm starting to scroll through my social medias for the first time in two days and thinking, Lincoln Riley said Alabama uh, didn't really play anybody. It don't play nobody, Paul. Uh, Okay, we're going to talk about Lincoln Riley scheduling for championships and not for their fans. Lincoln Riley, keep Alabama's name out of your mouth. As all, That'll be the uh, itinerary for the day. We'll start with Ryan Chapman's interview. We'll talk about those two topics, and then we'll close it down with our interview from Kirk Bowles from the Houston Chronicle. Before we do all that, though, we need to thank our friends, Purple Turtle Roofing. You can call them today for service at 877-PT-ROOF5. They're the most reliable residential roof replacement company in Alabama and in Mississippi. Whether it's addressing leaks, storm damage, or general wear and tear, Purple Turtle Roofing is going to be there to deliver exceptional roof repair for your property. Purple Turtle Roofing is the leading expert in local residential roofing solutions, specializing in providing unparalleled service and quality craftsmanship. Call Dustin Foley and his team today, 877-PT-ROOF5, for your free roof inspection. That's 877-787-6635. Visit them online at www.roofturtle.com. You can call them, schedule your free roof inspection. They'll come out. They'll look at your roof and let you know everything that you need going forward. They're going to make sure that you're prepared for all of life's storms. We thank Purple Turtle Roofing for sponsoring the program. So without further ado... We're going to play our interview with Ryan Chapman from Oklahoma Sooners on SI. We'll come back and we'll talk about those two topics, rivalries in the SEC, and then Lincoln Riley's out-of-pocket comments on the Alabama Crimson Tide and Nick Saban from Pac-12, uh, Pac-12 from Big Ten Media Days. 
Back in, this is the Joe Gaither Show right here on SEC Media Days, right here in Dallas. Live at Welcome back in. This is the Joe Gaither Show on Bama Central and BamaCentral.com. That's what we want to be saying. We're live here at SEC Media Days in Dallas, and I'm hanging out with Ryan Chapman, our newest affiliate, Oklahoma Sooners, Sooners on SI. Make sure you go give him a follow at underscore Ryan Chapman on the Twitter machine. He's hanging out with us, doing all kinds of radio row stuff, and you are reading him at Sooners on SI. We're going to have a great matchup in November between Alabama and Oklahoma. And personally, I can't wait to get out and see uh, what is it, uh, Daryl K. New Norman, Daryl uh, Royal Stadium. That's yeah. Texas. Yeah, that's Texas, Daryl K. Royal. Oak Memorial Stadium, Gaylord Fan Memorial Stadium. Should be, should be a ton of fun, man. That's what? A home and home in the early 2000s. Otherwise, it's basically been bowl matchups for the Sooners and the Crimson Tide. So. Some of those bowl matchups haven't gone well for the Alabama faith water. Right, the they've gone bad for OU, too. <laughs> just think uh, any any playoff game. Just Eric Stryker, right? Be, yeah. Coming around the corner, yeah. sacking A.J. McCarron about 8 million times. The only game. game that Trevor Knight played well in his entire career, either in Norman or in College Station. It, it, weird ones. Some and, weird ones. And y'all, tech, Oklahoma won both of those home and home games. They came to Tuscaloosa and won, what, 17-3, to three, some low-scoring of there in a kind of a dark time in Alabama history. But what are we going to find when we go out to Norman? We'll see the schooner coming out, and that's going to be awesome. You got Jackson Arnold behind under center, new, old quarterback. I mean, he played a little bit last year. A lot of transfers along the offensive line. It's kind of a make or break season for Brent Venables. By November, we will know if he's either made or broken. What are we expecting? What are you expecting this year out of Brent Venables? It, it's weird because. When you talk about Oklahoma, everyone's going to go offense, offense, offense. What the hell, defense? Like, what is that? And that's been true, right? No one's running from that. That's not what Brent Venables wants, right? He wants that to be well-rounded. You know those Clemson defenses Alabama does, obviously. And it's not the Clemson defense. It's not there. It's getting closer, though. Truly, the strength of this team is going to be the linebacking core and the secondary. They need to figure out the pass rush. That's what kind of killed Oklahoma's defensive numbers last year because offensively, Arnold's got all the arm talent in the world, but we just, it, we, he's a first-year starter. We don't know what that's going to look like. He should have really good wide receiver weapons. Deion Burks, a Purdue transfer, is probably going to be the dark horse guy. Not for like a all-SEC first team, but he's a name that you might not know right now that will be probably tearing up in Oklahoma. They feel good about the running backs. We don't know what the offensive line is. I don't know what the offensive line is going to look at. They're going into fall camp probably looking to have three positions up for grabs still. This team's going to go as far as the O-line goes, as long as the defense stays healthy. It's not going to be like an elite, elite, but it should be a top 40 unit, that OU defense, which is going to be brand new to the world of Norman, Oklahoma. Is Danny Stutzman the baddest man in the SEC? I, I'm not sure he's the baddest man in the SEC. He might be the best press conference in the SEC. Uh, he, he's quite the character. Uh, after OU Texas last year, him and uh, his, his, his son, uh, another classman, Jerry Cannick, got Texas Longhorn, like upside down, Longhorn tattoos on their thigh. They'll walk it, they'll talk it, but Danny Stutzman is the heartbeat of Oklahoma football right now. He He's the emotional leader. He'll, this team is going to go as Danny Stutzman goes defensively right there at middle linebacker, and he will be a first-team all SEC caliber guy as long as he stays healthy. All right, so I have defended the Red Devil rivalry on social media, and many people saying, oh, it's not the best rivalry in the SEC. But to me, I think it walks in the only rivalry with two blue bloods in college football is the Red River rivalry, will it hold up in the SEC amongst the Iron Bowl, Egg Bowl? Oh, my gosh. If you haven't experienced an Egg Bowl, deep, deep hatred. Tell us about the Red River rivalry. Yeah, it's going to hold up. I'm not an idiot. I'm not going to come in here and be like, it's the number one. I, it's different. It's it's hard to compare it to the Iron Bowl because I, I've never been to Derrick A. Royal Stadium. A lot of the people have never been to Norman. In Austin, right? It's because you get the Texas State Fair, and the cocktail party is its own thing, but it's something different when you've got the State Fair of Texas, the split is different than at the cocktail party. They go through the back of the end zone, right? It's 50-yard line. I know all my college buddies. Here's the move. You go to the concession stand. You get a hot dog. You load up with all the mustard, all the ketchup. If you're on the 50-yard line, that bad boy is getting launched to the Texas side. Like, like that's how that goes. That's how that goes. The, the thing that's really special about Texas, though, seriously, is the momentum swings. College football is all about momentum. It is truly... You leave one half of the field and you're at a home game. You go to the other half of the field, it's a road game. As long as one end doesn't empty out at halftime, that's why we've seen these massive games. You go back three years ago, the big Caleb Williams game where he came all the way back. Last year, it was back and forth, huge momentum swings. Texas dominated the second and third quarter. Oklahoma came out first quarter, fourth for all that stuff. It is a special environment. It's an awful stadium. The Cotton Bowl is old, but it's ours. You know, it's one of those sure. things. It's like it's our crappy stadium. Everybody back off. 
it, it, it's one of the special environments that uh, if you can get out to it, you have to because it's it's all weekend in Dallas going after it. It's all day on the fairground. And the most beautiful thing in the world is there's burn orange and crimson all morning long. The second that one of those teams loses, if Texas loses, all the orange is hightailing its way out the fair, and the fair becomes like an Oklahoma after party. Same thing in reverse if Texas wins. It's going to be incredible, and it will definitely hold up to the SEC. I'm not dumb. It might not be the number one year in, year out, but it's going to fit right in. We're hanging out with Ryan Chapman, and you're following him at underscore Ryan Chapman on the Twitter machine, and you're reading him at Sooners on SI, part of our rebrand right here at Alabama Central, Bama Central on SI. All right, so Alabama's going out to Oklahoma in November. And the first thing that I thought when I saw the schedule, and uh, thankfully my boss Chris Wall said, you're on the trip, Joe, is it's going to be cold. Yeah. And I cannot wait for new environments. Alabama went out to Texas two seasons ago, early in the season, 105 degrees, burning your, burning your brains out in Austin. What's it going to be in Norman, and what can we expect as far as atmosphere of the city? What can we enjoy in Norman? Uh, because everybody's going to go for the game the first trip. What will Norman be like for Alabama fans? Yeah, the first thing is I don't think you have to worry about, like, snow probably. Usually in Oklahoma, we don't really get snow. We get ice, and that comes January, February. So okay. it's not going to be that, but it will be cold. Those games do get pretty frosty. The, the big thing, uh, we were talking last night, Norman and Tuscaloosa have been to both a good deal. Pretty similar, actually. So I think that fans from Alabama, from Tuscaloosa, are going to be a little bit at home, a similar city environment. The, the campus corner area is what it's called, right by the stadium. That's the bar scene you're going to be hitting up. Just campus corner, search it. You'll find it. You'll be in the right spot. And Oklahoma fans are stoked, man. Coming in, it's one of the fan bases that Oklahoma really respects and, and understands, like, no, no, no. We're a blue blood. That's a blue blood. That's what it should look like, all that. And so it's going to be a ton of fun. Uh, tailgating opened up. It's more of a... Oklahoma's tailgating environment is more of a sprawl all across campus. It's not like the Grove of everybody's at one spot or things like that. So you'll be able to bounce all the way around campus, all that stuff. They've got Heisman Park right out there by the east side of the stadium on the other side with all the statues, all that. It's kind of unique for, to Oklahoma, not Heisman winners, but they, that was one of the centennial projects of putting up statues. And then once you get in, I mean, the place is going to be rocking. Alabama's coming to town. Oklahoma's stoked. They've been looking forward to this. It's not Iowa State anymore. That's not the big game that you can circle in November at the end of the year. It should be a ton of fun. But Oklahoma, it, I don't, this is where I don't know if they're going to fit in initially to the SEC. They're kind of known for the hospitality and welcoming everybody in. It's not going to be – it'll be hostile for Kalen DeBoer and Jalen Miller. It's not going to be hostile for Alabama fans coming in. It should be a big party. And it should be a great weekend all, all the way around. All right, so are we going to be doing the who's the superior crimson for the next 20 years? I think so. I think that there's going to be a lot of I think there's going to be a lot of crimson jokes. I think there's a lot going to be a lot of that, uh, but it should be a ton of fun. All right, one two, one more question and then a personal question. Yeah, Brent Venables, we heard him yesterday. Our new 12 team college football playoff. Are Oklahoma Sooners fans, especially? I mean, we we talked about all the changes and kind of the unknowns. Is this is the expectation still the same? Get to the college football playoff this season? Yeah, it's. It's really interesting because if this were a four-team playoff, I think that you might have a more tempered, reasonable expectation from Oklahoma fans of, like, new quarterback. I think they get it. I think that they get that they're not afraid of the schedule. They also don't think they're going to walk in and reel off 12-0. No one's like that. No one will be undefeated this year. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I think that they get that. With a 12-team playoff, though, I think there is pressure on Brent Venables. You look at what he's done. Oklahoma, under Venables, is 3-7 and seven in one-score games. That's 0-5 in year one, where he was rebuilding Lincoln Riley's roster that he kind of talked about yesterday. Last year it was 3-2, and two, so they took those steps forward. That's going to be the thing that Oklahoma fans, if Oklahoma reels off another like 1-4 and four in one-score games and doesn't make the playoff, they're going to be ticked off. They're going to be pretty mad. So they love Brent Venables. He's viewed as one of their own, even though he spent the decade at Clemson for what he did with Bob Stoops, bringing a national championship back to Norman. He's going to get a little bit of leeway, but... Eight and four, nine and three is probably the nine and three. I think people will be cool with eight and four. You got to give me some context. Anything below that, and people are going to be hot. All right. So, personal note I'm a Chicago Bears fan. Yeah. Drafting Caleb Williams. Yeah. We all spent a little bit of time with him before transferring to USC. Is he the savior we're all believing in? I look, man, I love Caleb Williams. I think that <laughs> off schedule, he's going to be incredible. He's a dynamic personality. He's weird. He's different, all that stuff. So you're going to have to get used to that a little bit. The nails oh, I'm not thing. Pay my you're the, yeah, the, you're the nails. Like, it was really funny. People in Norman for like a year, they're like, we can get with the nails. Then to, immediately they're like, screw paint your nails with the man's game, all that stuff. No, you're going to have to get with that. But no, Caleb's awesome. Incredible arm talent. He's a really smart guy. Um, I, I think he's going to be fine in the NFL, as long as he doesn't get hurt in the first couple of years. Like that, that's the big thing. As long as he doesn't get banged up the first couple of years, I think he's going to be great. Well, it's been a lot of fun. We're hanging out with Ryan Chapman. You're reading him at 
Sooners on SI. Make sure you go follow him, underscore Ryan Chapman on the Twitter machine. And we're excited for a great partnership. Oklahoma in the SEC and Oklahoma, the Sooners on SI, rebranding with Bama Central on SI as well. Ryan, thanks for your time. Enjoy the rest of the week. Absolutely. We'll see you guys. Absolutely. This is Ryan Chapman, who joined us uh, out there in Dallas at SEC Media Days, and we really, really appreciate him giving us some of his time at a busy SEC Media Day session. So let's get right into one of the conversations that we had with Ryan Chapman, and that's where does the Red River rivalry stack up in the SEC? And again, I hope maintain what I told Ryan. I think it might be the only rivalry in the SEC with two blue blood programs. And that immediately got a lot of folks into uh, my mentions. And that's A-OK. -okay. We invite you to correct me at Joe Gaither 6 if you feel that way uh, on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Oh, Texas is not a blue blood. Texas is not a blue blood, Joe. What have they done lately? Where's their national championships lately? But the fact of the matter is Texas is a blue blood program because they are one of the biggest brands in college football. And yes, the brand power often overshadows maybe the success that Texas has had, but they are the fourth winning its football program in, 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 in college football. They won 33 conference championships, what, two Heisman Trophy winners, I believe. Uh, so they're not a scrub program and maybe you maybe they're not quite to the blue blood standard that Alabama is and that Ohio State is but uh I will I think that they belong as one of the seven blue bloods in college football so that brings us to the rivalries in the SEC and I wrote down 10 and I got six honorable mentions and then I ordered my 10 uh one through 10 so uh let me I think I still have the uh the game sounder here yeah the uh winning sounder yeah perfect win sound effect we got that sitting right there so we're gonna go 10 to 1 uh we're gonna go 10 to 1 and obviously we're gonna talk about these SEC rivalries real quick number 10 on my list I have one of the newest rivalries uh, renewing here in the SEC. Number 10, I have Oklahoma and Missouri. Obviously, it's not the biggest rivalry in the SEC, but uh, I think that it is a very, very strong rivalry, and it's going to be a lot of fun. And when you compare it to some of the honorable mentions that I have, I think it being – Oklahoma is probably second biggest rival in the conference. Obviously, they're going to renew a rivalry with Arkansas, and, and they're going to have a lot of fun tangling it up with uh, LSU. But I think that Oklahoma and Missouri is going to be an underrated rivalry. Going to fall into the category of, oh, Egg Bowl rivalry where not everyone watches it, but when you do watch the Egg Bowl, you sit back and you take it in and you think, this is a hell of a football game. Uh, obviously, the Egg Bowl will be much higher on my list, but number 10, I'm putting Oklahoma and Missouri. Number nine, I'm going with the Deep South's old, oldest rivalry, Georgia and Auburn. Georgia and Auburn at number at number nine. Uh, I grew up a little bit on this rivalry uh, with a Georgia background. Both my parents graduated from Georgia, so I grew up in a Georgia household. And always, always hated Auburn. Uh, so that was an easy transition to make when I, when I, when I transferred to Tuscaloosa coming to school here. Uh, that was an easy transition to pick up and continue to uh, hate on the Auburn Tigers. But I think... Georgia and Auburn is a great rivalry. Deep South's oldest rivalry been played many, 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 many years. And because of its history, I have it right here in the top 10. I don't have it any higher because, especially, and, and especially in the last handful of years, Georgia has absolutely dominated them. Georgia has dominated the Auburn Tigers since Kirby Smart has uh, been in place. Now, Georgia and Kirby Smart have dominated a lot of people, uh, but that's why I don't have it any higher on my list. And number eight is the first Alabama rivalry on my list. I'm putting Alabama and LSU as the eighth best rivalry in the SEC. Oh my gosh, I keep missing it for the wrong, for the wrong button right there. There we go. Alabama and LSU and number eight. And you could say, oh, it should be a lot higher. Think about how many NFL players have played in this rivalry over the last decade. And you're exactly right. But the same thing, the same thing that can be said uh, from the Georgia and Auburn rivalry can be said for Alabama, excuse me, and LSU. Obviously, Brian Kelly won two years ago down there in Baton Rouge. And the LSU won over here in 20, what was that, 19, the Joe Burrow year. So with Ed Orgeron. But outside of that, in the Nick Saban era, Alabama absolutely dominated this rivalry. You went down to and you lost in Brian Dean Stadium in 2007. I think that's it, right? Oh, the, the game of the century, the uh, six to three, uh, nine, nine, nine to six game. 
but really outside of that. So that's what four LSU wins in the span of 17 years. Can't be a much higher rivalry on this list if it's not going, uh, if the pendulum is not evenly swinging back and forth. At number seven, I've got a rivalry where I don't really have a big feeling for either team, Tennessee and Florida. And for the same reason, Florida has dominated this rivalry, but the heat is very, very hot between these two schools. Uh, I have a couple friends who love the Tennessee Vols, and they want nothing more than to see the worst things befall the Florida Gators. It would probably be higher on my list if uh, Tennessee had been irrelevant. And now if Florida had been irrelevant uh, for the last handful of years, obviously Florida still kind of taking the lion's share of the wins in this rivalry over the last two decades. But uh, neither program after the Tim Tebow days, after the Urban Meyer days, neither program really mattering as far as conference championships and beyond. So no higher than number seven for Tennessee and Florida. Number six is sort of the same way, but I'm going with uh, the world's largest outdoor cocktail party. I know that it had many, many different names, but Georgia and Florida is a very, very big rivalry. One of the few rivalries in the SEC that is still played at a neutral stadium over there in Jacksonville. And we'll see if the, that continues. I know Kirby Smart has been uh, dancing around the idea of getting that game back, uh, getting that game to Athens and to, uh, that was, not Tallahassee, to Gainesville. Uh, but I think that it being in a neutral location adds and enhances maybe the the rough feelings, the hard feelings between the two schools. And while Florida dominated in my early childhood, Georgia has been dominating since the since Kirby Smart's taken over. Uh, and so it's been kind of a rivalry, a major big pendulum swings. Uh, great robbery, but I have it as number six because of Florida's major step back as far as how relevant they are. Number five is a rivalry close to everybody's heart, and it's the second Alabama rivalry on this list for me. Number five, I'm putting the, the, the third Saturday in October. Alabama and Tennessee, obviously another rivalry where one side has been dominating for many, many years. Alabama, what, 16-1 and one during the Nick Saban era. Uh, and, of course, the Tennessee fans rightfully so holding on to that one. Uh, 2022, right? Yeah, 22 up there in Knoxville. What, 17 penalties committed for Alabama. But that, re- that game really, really sparked the 23 matchup. Alabama has been dominant on the scoreboard, but mo- there's been a couple of close games in between. Obviously, Derrick Henry cashes in a, a touchdown run to seal a big win. You had the Rocky block. Uh, so there's been some close games over the last 17 years, but another rivalry where one side has been dominating the other. And I think that hurts the quality of the, the rivalry. So, I mean, you might be watching me as a Georgia fan thinking, oh, Georgia, Florida should be much higher. But do, do the Florida Gators have a good shot or have a decent shot of beating Georgia this year? No, I don't think so. I think that's going to be a pretty cake cakewalk game for Georgia, uh, as was last year. And, and really, like you look through all these rivalries, Georgia has been dominating Auburn, Alabama has been dominating LSU, Florida has mostly dominated Tennessee. I think that that hurts the quality of some of these rivalries. So that's why some of these bigger, more traditional SEC rivalries aren't as high on my list. But, but, <clears throat> But there's my number five, Alabama and Tennessee. Number four, I'm going to the te- to to Texas uh, for the first time, and I'm taking Texas and Texas A&M. And I cannot wait to see this rivalry renewed on Thanksgiving night. It'll either be Thanksgiving night or Black Friday this year. And these two teams, look, I know it's not the Iron Bowl, but these two teams hate each other so, so much. And I think that especially what you've seen with the baseball rivalry and Kirk uh, Kirk Bowles, we'll we'll, uh, we'll talk about it a little bit more in my interview and discussion with him out there in Dallas that we'll close the show with. But I think that this rivalry is resemblant a little bit of the Egg Bowl and a little bit of the Iron Bowl where you have a clear little brother in Texas A&M and a clear big boy brand, a big brother brand, the Alabama brand, the Ole Miss brand in those two respective rivalries in Texas. And obviously, you've got the political kind of uh, movements. Texas A&M wants to leave the Big 12 to go to the SEC. We want to be the only SEC to, uh, Texas team in SEC. And then Texas comes in and follows them. And you see what happens with the baseball program this year. And it's just uh, a nasty rivalry. So I've got Texas and Texas A&M coming in at number four on my list. 
Number three on my list would be a lot higher if either of these teams would compete for an SEC championship. I think it might be the best rivalry in the SEC as far as hatred goes, but there's other prestige factors that put the, the top two rivalries over it. It's the Egg Bowl. I'm putting Ole Miss and Mississippi State at number three are my best rivalries in the SEC. I think that these two programs – wake up each and every day hating one another and really think about the other university, think about beating the other university more than any other goal. Obviously, the goal is to win the national championship, but I think that each university, first and foremost, thinks about beating the other 365 days a year, and this year's Egg Bowl is going to be so much fun with Jeff Levy and Lane Kiffin going against one another, two former uh, coaches, Levy Levy working with Lane Kiffin, and uh, I think that that adds extra spice to the rivalry, and honestly, it might be one of the best offensive showings in the, uh, as far as a game, both sides of a game, uh, this season in the SEC. I'm really, really looking forward to the Egg Bowl. All right, so here we go. We got two through eight already done, and that's what everybody's question. Joe, are you going to put the Red River rivalry over the Iron Bowl? And I know I've gone on social media before in the last two weeks, especially once Texas and Oklahoma came into the SEC, and I think that I was dancing on it being the number one rivalry in the SEC, but my number two, I'm going with Texas and Oklahoma, the Red River rivalry. And yes, I do think that the the prestigious, the two brands, Oklahoma and Texas, are bigger brands combined than Alabama and Auburn. Sorry, Auburn, you're not holding up your end of the deal there. But really, I think Ryan Spit, I think Ryan did a great great job. It's going to hold up in the SEC, but it hasn't been played yet in the SEC. And for that reason, uh, for that reason, I'm going to keep the Iron Bowl ahead of it uh, just because we haven't seen it yet and seen how it will affect the SEC. Last year, Oklahoma getting a last-minute stop uh, on the goal line, winning the Red River rivalry, but it was Texas that uh, handled its business the rest of the year and were, was able to get into the college football playoff, so it didn't keep the Texas Longhorns out of the college football playoff. Uh, so I'm going with the Texas and Oklahoma, number two, and that makes number one very, very obvious. I am going with Alabama-Auburn, the Iron Bowl, as the best rivalry in the SEC. And because of uh, you asked me why, obviously, you got the Alabama factor. We're sitting right here in Tuscaloosa. But the other major factor is the national implications over the last handful of years. Now, Auburn has fallen off of this. But for a moment in the early 2010s, what was it, 09 to 14 or so, the winner of the winner of the Iron Bowl went to the SEC championship game and played in the college football, in, in the uh, BCS, and then the college football playoff. It was very, very important for uh, for basically national standing and national seating. And while Auburn's brand is not necessarily on par with Alabama's brand, it's not necessarily on par with Texas or Oklahoma's brand. Uh, from you know 09 to 14 or 15, I think that they, they were uh, having just as much say. Obviously, Cam Newton winning a national championship, and that was a historic and special season for the Auburn Tigers. But uh, if 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 Alabama lost to Auburn, uh, sometimes you know you had you had the uh, the 2017 year you lost to Auburn, but you were able to win a national championship on second and two of six. Uh, but but really, I think the Iron Bowl for what it has been and what it has given the SEC in terms of memories and in terms of uh, epic plays. Obviously, Gravedigger comes to our minds from this past season. The kick six comes to everyone's mind. Uh, from the Auburn side, you have Greg McElroy dumping it off to Roy Upchurch. Uh, really, and the hits go on and on and on as far back as you go. So I am going with the Iron Bowl as my number one rivalry in the SEC. All right, let's flip it just a little bit. Uh, and before we do, and, and as we do, we're going to tell you about our friend Derek Daniel, Derek Daniel State Farm agent right here in Tuscaloosa. He can get you set up with your home life and auto insurance needs. Call Derek Daniel at 205 758 
You know you need home life and auto insurance, especially if you have a family. You need to make sure that you're covered uh, properly with the right life insurance. Uh, obviously, we don't want any bad things to happen, but emergencies do happen. That's why you have insurance. You don't want to get in that accident on the road, but you need to make sure you're properly covered so that you can get back on the road and keep your family moving. So make sure that you have the proper auto insurance. That's really the easiest one to go ahead and check. Call Derek Daniel at 205-758-3391. They can get you a, an auto insurance quote very, very quickly. They've got great agents in there, Red, Victoria, and Reese. They'll get you on the phone. And Derek Daniel will pick up the phone as well. He can answer any questions you want to have a local agent an agent who has your back who knows your face who knows your name who knows your story Derek daniel is that agent call him at 205-758-3391 and if you'd rather visit him in person it's 4604 highway 69 north in northport alabama just a little bit off of mcfarland boulevard you're heading up highway 69 you're past some tiger rock on the left and it's about a mile it's about a mile half mile past that right there on the left as well. So tell Derek there, Daniel that we sent you. Make sure that you get your home life and auto insurance needs taken care of today with Derek Daniel State Farm. All right, so I want to keep it going with one more topic before we close it out with our friend Kirk Brolis from the Houston Chronicle. And as I said, I missed most of the news day yesterday, Wednesday, and the day before Tuesday. Drove up to Chicago, had a great time with a couple of friends. We watched the Cub games. Cubs game sat through a rain delay, and it was just a great time in the big city for a day or two. I'm driving back last night and getting back and settled in the house here in Tuscaloosa, and thank you, Lord. I'm getting back, and I'm seeing Lincoln Riley, Alabama, Alabama, Lincoln Riley, getting out of the US, the Notre Dame game, trying to get out of the Notre Dame game. And his quote was as follows at Big Ten Media Day, talking about scheduling, talking about should USC continue with the Big Ten. I believe it's going to be nine this season. Let's count them up. Let's see. Uh, Michigan one, Wisconsin two, Minnesota three, Penn State four, Maryland five, Rutgers six, Washington seven, Nebraska eight. Uh, and yeah, UCLA 10, they're playing 10 conference games. And so that's great. I mean, uh, 10, 11, 12, is that right? Did I just count that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine. I cannot count for anything. I'm not a math major. They're playing nine conference games. Just like I said at the very beginning, when I tried to confirm it, uh, got myself tripped up, uh, one plus one equals two. They're playing nine conference games this year. And really, Lincoln Riley is debating the validity of this Notre Dame matchup because you're looking at USC's schedule, and this year they've got a great opening game. They're, they're playing against uh, LSU out there in Las Vegas, and that's going to be a huge marquee game. I'm going to be watching that Sunday evening uh, on ABC, what's that, Labor Day weekend, and it's going to be a blast. But Lincoln Riley's talking about getting out of the game with Notre Dame, and his comment uh, in his comment and in his reasoning, he basically slanders one himself uh, because he was coaching up in 2016 at, at USC. So he, he slandered one of his USC teams. But he's slow. you want to slander Nick Saban? Fine. Do it when he deserves it. Uh, and, and that's a okay. I'm not going to defend him when he doesn't deserve it. But you keep Alabama's name out your mouth in this topic. And you keep Nick Saban's name out your mouth when it comes to this topic. Let's read his quote, and then we'll break it down. From Lincoln Riley, Bama was ahead of the curve for years, I thought, on how they scheduled the non-conference. They would occasionally hit the marquee non-conference game. They play one late, so they essentially got a little bit of a bye week there late in the season. They didn't schedule for their fans – they schedule to win championships. My hope is that we can do the best things, schedule to win championships. That includes the rivalry game for all that comes with that and all that it means. But if you get into positions, you've got to make a decision on what the priority is, end quote. All right, Lincoln Riley, I've got two major uh, contentions with your topic. First thing, they would occasionally hit the marquee non-conference game. All right, Nick Saban, I wrote down all 17 years of the marquee non-conference game, right? Uh, and I came away with one 
one game that wasn't marquee. All right, 2007, Alabama plays Florida State. Oh, oh eight, they play Clemson. Oh nine, they play Virginia Tech. Eleven and uh, ten and eleven, they go on a home and home with Penn State up there in Happy Valley. Then uh, in the second year, you got Michigan in, in Jerry World. You got Virginia Tech. You got West Virginia. In fifteen, you played Wisconsin. In sixteen, Alabama played your USC Trojans. Lincoln Riley beat you guys fifty-two to seven. In seventeen, you play Florida. To state over in uh Atlanta in 18, you go down to Orlando. Okay, okay, you want to talk about Louisville, but they did produce a Heisman Trophy winner in that era. So you played Louisville in 18, you played Duke in 19. There's my star, there's my asterisk in 20. All right, they didn't play anybody in 20. Why not? COVID-19, an all-SEC schedule for your boy, Lane Lincoln Riley. In 21, you play Miami. In 22 and 23, how about a home-and-home home with the University of Texas? So, Lincoln Riley, what, what do you need a definition of what occasionally is? Occasionally is once in a blue moon. Occasionally is once every three or four years. But I just read 17 matchups in, se- in uh, well, 16, excuse me, COVID-19, 16 matchups in 17 years, and only one of them was against maybe a less than stellar opponent. And even the blue, the Duke Blue Devils are a power four conference team at that time, a power five conference team. You talk about, oh, well, Louisville wasn't that good. Louisville was an ACC member at the time, had already left their time with the Big East, the American, whatever they wanted to call that, and it was in the ACC. Anybody else on this list you want to poke holes at? Okay, 2021 Miami was not the Miami of old. And obviously you didn't know that Texas was going to be in resurgence. And of course, 2010 and 2011 Penn State, you've got the last days of Joe Paterno. But basically from a scheduling standpoint, And that's what we're talking about here, Lincoln Riley. From a scheduling standpoint, you have scheduled brand after brand after brand after brand. Two times against Florida State. You you, you played Clemson. Two times against Virginia Tech. You played Michigan. Two times against Texas. How much much better do you want us to get right here as far as our marquee non-conference game that we occasionally schedule? What a joke, Lincoln Riley. What a joke. What an absolute joke. And then he says... Well, they didn't schedule for their fans. Uh, they didn't schedule for their fans. They scheduled to win championships. Now, I'll let's back up just a little bit. He talked about occasionally hit the marquee non-conference game. We've addressed that. It wasn't occasionally. It was every single year. And he follows it. They play with two other not very good teams. You're right. And goodness gracious, we have gone over that at nauseum. Get the San Jose States, get the Mercers, get the UT Martins, get these schools off of the Alabama schedule. Get them out of Brian Denny Stadium. And I know, I know, I know that it's all about, oh, you got to pay the check. That check goes a long way in their athletic department. And, oh, the SEC is so tough. Oh, this, that, and the other. Fine. You got the SEC schedule. It's very, very challenging. It is what it is. But uh, Lincoln Riley, you're right. The other two games were usually against Scrub University, Northwestern Tech School for the Blind and Dumb. Yeah, all right, that's all right. And you're right there. But occasionally scheduling non-conference games, scheduling one marquee non-conference game, this is 16 out of 17 years, and the 17th year was wrecked by COVID-19. Somebody needs to get a, little, get, a, get a definition check. And so he finishes that statement. They didn't schedule for their fans. They scheduled to win, to win championships. And I got another contention with that. Go through this schedule. Where did you play these schools, right? All right, you play Florida State in Jacksonville, Clemson in Atlanta, Virginia Tech in Atlanta. These are easy road trips, but nice, nice and fun stadiums for your fan base to go check out. Okay, you keep going. We're going to Happy Valley. Oh, my gosh. You give me a home-and-home home with Penn State right now, and I would love it. What a stadium. What an experience. And then, boom, in 12, you're going to play Michigan at Jerry World. That's the first. You're, you're pretty much a brand-new stadium. I'm pretty sure that Jerry World opened in, like, 08, 09, 10. So you're in the first couple of years of Jerry World playing Michigan. I'm pretty sure you played Virginia Tech out there again in 13. Now, West Virginia wasn't that in 14 in Atlanta. I believe it was. You're back in Jerry World for 15 to play Wisconsin. You're back in Jerry World to play USC. Dallas, easy place for Alabama fans to get to. Huge stadium, big time five, nice city. Like, I'm sorry, you give me a destination to start the season? If I'm into my fanboy mode, I'm getting all excited about that. 
Florida State over in Mercedes-Benz and against Atlanta. All right, we're tired of playing in Atlanta. We're tired of playing in Dallas. Well, why don't we go play Louisville in Camping World Stadium in Orlando? A little bit of a little Florida trip to start the season off for your fan base in Orlando. Disney World on Friday, Alabama football on Saturday. What more could you want? All right, the Duke game, I'm pretty sure that was in Mercedes-Benz. Obviously, again, you're back in Atlanta, not as special of a time. COVID-19, all right, you're out in 20. Miami, I'm pretty sure that was back in my, in Atlanta. We're getting used to playing in Mercedes-Benz Stadium. We've been there, done that at this point. So what do we do next? A home-and-home home trip to Austin, Texas. We're going to keep Austin weird by having Alabama fans roll into Austin and enjoy uh, the a, Tex a game with the Texas Longhorns. I'm sorry. If I'm just Mr. Fan uh, for these 16, 17 years, this is for the fans. It's a great opportunity for the fans to go see some of these great brands and just look ahead. Look ahead to the home and homes. We're, 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 you know, South Florida, you want to count whether that being a marquee game on paper? No, it's not. But you were down in Tampa last year, Alabama fans. Wisconsin going to Wisconsin this year. I cannot wait to get to Wisconsin this season. And it goes on and on and on and on down the line of the schedule. I know Notre Dame's on the schedule out, out in front. I know Ohio State is on the schedule out in front. Arizona is out on the schedule. I think Arizona State is as well. Like you've got about a dozen years of great road trips to look forward to year in and year out. I'm pretty sure Notre Dame is on the schedule uh, in the future. There are big-time brands, big-time destinations for your fans to go experience over the next 12 years. What about you, USC? What about you, Lincoln Riley? Of course, we know Notre Dame. The Notre Dame game is a non-conference game, and it's a rivalry game. And honestly, you should keep it. You absolutely should keep it. Nothing wrong with that. But what about you for your last couple of years? Under you, Lincoln Riley, in 2022, your first season at USC, you played Rice. You played Rice, Fresno State, and Notre Dame. Okay, you get the Notre Dame game, premier game, battle for the Jewel Chilele. It's a big-time brand. Love it. Don't take it off your schedule. That's what we're all talking about. Should Notre Dame and USC continue to play its games? Yes, you should. He's talking about, well, maybe we should cancel it because we're playing nine Big Ten games, and we've got teams like Oregon and then Ohio State and Michigan in our league. Well, welcome to a big boy conference here. So in 22, you played Rice, Fresno State, and Notre Dame. You whooped Rice by 52 points. You whooped Fresno State by 28 points. And you played Notre Dame. You beat them by 11 at home. Okay, great. Roll Caleb Williams. That's great. But is that a great non-conference schedule? Is that scheduling for a championships or scheduling for your fan base? I mean, uh, what, what, what are we doing here, Lincoln Riley? In 2023, last season, you played San Jose State. You whooped them by 28 points. You played Nevada. You whooped them by 52 points. And then you went to South Bend, and Caleb Williams went bonkers, couldn't read a defense for anything, played his worst game in college, and it was a 28-point loss. Lincoln Riley, what, who are we talking about here? What, what are we really doing here? Uh, you, you, you're really throwing me off here in 2022. You're, you're, uh, let's see. Yeah. Reload that 22 schedule, please. We're uh, in 22. When you played rice and Fresno state and Notre Dame, uh, you ended up going to the, to the, uh, to the PAC 12 championship. You lost to Utah in that PAC 12 championship game, right? Your, your conference schedule was Oregon state. Ooh, Oregon State, it was uh, it was Oregon State, it was Stanford, Arizona State, Washington State, at Utah, which you lost 43-42, to at Arizona, Cal, Colorado, and UCLA. Like, I'm sorry, I don't hear big and scary, obviously Utah, nice little program right there, but I don't hear, oh, it's a team that you need to be running from, Colorado on your schedule, you won 55-17. to 17. You UCLA, I mean, you played a three-point game with UCLA. What are we doing here? You beat Washington State 30 to 14. This is just uh, disingenuous, in my opinion. Not really understanding what you are, not really understanding who you are. In 2023, you beat San Jose State, you beat Nevada, you got your butt kicked by Notre Dame. But your conference schedule, Stanford. 
56 to 10. Arizona State win 42 to 28. Colorado, which I don't know why it was this close last year with Colorado, but 48 41 win. You t- you went to overtime with Arizona. Oh my gosh. Ooh, big bad Arizona. You lost to Notre Dame. You lost to Utah again. You beat Cal by one point. Uh, and that's oh, not a good win. You lost to Kalen DeBoer in Washington by 10. You lost to Oregon uh, by 9. And you lost to UCLA by 18. Look, it's not about we need to get Notre Dame off our schedule and schedule to win championships. you got a long way to go before you have to worry about scheduling for championships, Lincoln Riley. Sure, you're a quarterback whisperer. you got great Heisman Trophy winners and lots of runner-ups on your resume. I think Jalen Hurts finished second. I know Kyler Murray won. I know Caleb Williams won it. I know uh, Baker Mayfield won it. Like you've got all kinds of quarterback, quarterback whisperer, Lincoln Riley, but you got bigger fish to fry. You're worrying about putting a defense on the field, worrying about coaching everyone outside of the quarterback, being an organizational leader, not being an emotional manipulator, banning reporters for doing their job. Lincoln Riley, keep Alabama's name out of your mouth. Nick Saban's name out of your mouth, especially when you're so wrong. Look, that's cool. Criticize Alabama, criticize Nick Saban all you want when you're right. Absolutely. You're wide open. Use the facts and criticize Nick Saban and Alabama as much as you want to when you have the facts on your side. But at this point, the facts are not on your side. Alabama didn't occasionally schedule non-conference games. They scheduled it 16 out of 17 years, with one of those years being COVID-19. All right, you want to get technical, scratch Duke off, give them 15 out of 17 under Nick Saban. That's pretty much every single year. You want to talk about not scheduling for fans. You get Alabama gave its fans, gave its fans experiences after experiences in many foreign stadiums, and then flip it. You want to criticize about the Mercers and the San Jose States and the Kent States that come to Tuscaloosa? That's fine. It is bad football. But you know what else it is? It's an opportunity for maybe the fans that don't get to come to the third Saturday in October, the Alabama-Tennessee game, who don't get to watch Alabama and LSU because they're, quite frankly, priced out of Bryant-Denny Stadium, priced out of Saban Field at Bryant-Denny Stadium. So what it does When Mercer comes to uh, Tuscaloosa in November, oh, man, you're going to see a cheap ticket. And people who haven't seen Alabama this season will get to see Alabama at a very affordable rate. And so, look, does that help me as someone who's covering the game? No, it doesn't. But it is pretty fan-friendly. And so, come on, Lincoln Riley, keep Alabama's name out your mouth. Keep Nick Saban's name out of your mouth. Learn to coach a little bit of defense. Learn to coach your team through a 12-game season instead of, oh, up, we're up, we're down, we're down, riding your emotional wave. I know you coach great offense, and whatever you're telling these quarterbacks, it's working, and they are getting better under your tutelage. You're a great quarterbacks coach. Maybe that's all you are. But if you want to take USC into the stratosphere, return USC to the place that matches their brand. We've been talking a lot about brands today, but USC is a blue blood brand. But what have they done since Matt Leinart and Reggie Bush and Pete Carroll uh, all moved on from Southern California? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. You've run through Clay Helton, Lane Kiffin, Steve Sarkeesian. You've run through lots of coaches. And Lincoln Riley, if you want to take USC back to, frankly, where they belong, don't worry about your schedule. Worry about your own team and keep Alabama's name out your mouth. We're going to finish this show with our friend Kirk Bowles. Kirk Bowles joined us out there in Dallas. Kirk Bowles writes now for the Houston Chronicle. When he was joined us, I believe he was with the Austin Elder Statesman, uh, but now he has moved on to the Houston Chronicle. And so we're going to finish our show with Kirk Bowles from out there in Dallas. Back to Dallas. This is SEC Media Days right here on the Joe Gaither Show on Bama Central and BamaCentral.com. And I'm here with Kirk Bowles from the Houston Chronicle. He joined us in the fall for Alabama's matchup with, te- with Texas. So it's great to see him in person. Kirk, thanks so much for your time. Hey, glad to be with you, Joe. Absolutely. We're here in Dallas, obviously, because Texas and Oklahoma are joining the SEC. So we'll just get your first thoughts. We talked in the fall about the big matchup. Now it's kind of official. Texas and Oklahoma are in the conference. What's the excitement level for the Texas Longhorns? Uh, Off the charts, Joe, uh, as you well know. Uh, It's been a long three years, you know. It's like it was announced three years ago. 
we kept thinking it was never going to get here. So it's kind of been the, at the back of Texas' mind as they uh, wander through the final days of the Big 12. But, yeah, I think there's as much buzz and excitement uh, among Longhorn fans as there's ever been. How much confidence in last year's matchup in Tuscaloosa, beating Alabama by double digits uh, in Tuscaloosa, give the Texas Longhorn faithful that when Texas is in the league, as they are right now, yeah. that they can compete at a high level with the rest of the league? You're right, Joe. It proved something to themselves that they were SEC ready. They could think they were and they could say they were, but until you do it, it's only hypothetical. And so to go into Tuscaloosa, as we both remember, and the win by double digits was just staggering. And I think in some ways, they surprised themselves just by the fact that they played such a complete game sure. against Alabama, but also winning. And then and that propelled them to the 12-2 and two season and getting into the playoff for the first time. So you cannot underestimate how big that win was. It was a great night, really, for me experiencing it. I was up there with the Texas band, and while Alabama came out on the losing end, experiencing the Texas tradition was something that will stick with me for a long, long time. Well, these are two heavyweights. They are as powerful brands as you can get. And, and that's another reason why Texas and Oklahoma are both going into the league. So I don't know if you could have gotten two more better draws and into already the premier league. So it's just, it's going to be good in every sport too, but you know, football just takes on a whole new level. Where does the Red River rivalry stack up in the SEC? Lots have been made about, oh, it's not the Iron Bowl, it's not the Egg Bowl. But I think yeah. maybe the SEC fans have been a little bit tribal. They don't really know what the Red River rivalry means and how it stacks up nationally. And, and I don't blame them for, for thinking their rivalries are the best. But to me, I grew up on Texas OU football, went to UT, uh, got out in the 70s, and, and I've been to uh, just over 50 Texas OU games. So. And I've seen a few of them, and, and the thing that separates is you have two huge brands, two state universities who are the flagship schools of their respective states, and the stadium is always packed. It's held during the middle of the state fair, and uh, and it's split right down the middle, you know, 50 of 50, all the way around. And the tunnel where they come out is always the Oklahoma side, so the Longhorns always get an earful, but it just never seems to disappoint. And... Uh, I think it's definitely on a rivalry, a rivalry on par with Alabama, Auburn, or Michigan, Ohio State. I cannot wait to see it and have it be a part of the SEC. Texas, we're about to hear from them at the podium. Steve Sarkeesian, Quinn Ewers, and the like. We've made a lot of We've heard from Jackson Dart. We've heard from Jalen Milrow and Brady Cook. But maybe Quinn Ewers, is he the best quarterback in the SEC? Ooh. You got it to prove, and I think Carson Beck might take some issues with that. Sure. But, but he's in the conversation. I mean, this is his third year to start. You know, he was a one-time commitment to Texas, went to Ohio State, and then transferred after one year. So he's really grown into the role. And uh, he's been hurt the last two years and missed, I think it's five games. So he could have gone to the NFL, but there were so many great quarterbacks. I yeah. mean, six second, first 12 picks. So I think that kind of enticed him to come back, and as well as some – unfinished business since they didn't get out of the semifinals. So it has a history maybe of not finishing uh, an entire season. I think it dates back to his time in high school. Right. So will we see Arch Manning and <laughs> will that uh, create controversy in the Texas Long in the Texas Longhorn locker room? That's kind of the question everybody's been asking in Austin for a couple of years now. Uh, my advice to Quinn was if you do get hurt, don't stay hurt very long. You might not get the job back. And, and Arch Manning has been so impressive. You know, he only throw five passes last year and in such a limited role, but he lit it up in the spring game through three touchdown passes. He's like 6'4", well over 200 pounds, and he runs well too. So I definitely think Arch is all that. And while a lot of people with different families might have transferred a long time ago, he feels very content backing up Quinn Hughes for now. Let's talk about two guys that Alabama fans are very familiar with. Amari Knight Black and Isaiah Bond. Obviously, Isaiah Bond, the hero from the Gravedigger play, 4-31. Right. Uh, you got some guys who have left Alabama, gone to Texas. What's the expectation for those guys? Isaiah Bond might be an NFL first-round draft pick this year. He might be, and that's exactly what they needed because they lost their top five wide receivers. And, and you're talking about you know a first-rounder like Xavier Worthy with Kansas City Chiefs, uh, A.D. Mitchell, who you know was a star Georgia, and uh, – maybe drop one pass all year. He was as good a one-year player as Texas has ever had. So, you know, with, with those two gone and Jatavian Sanders and Jordan Whittington, there was a void there. 
And so they really hit the portal really hard. And I think they're looking at Isaiah Bond to be their alpha receiver, you know, bring his A game and be the guy. And uh, because it's it's kind of a blank slate, they got a lot of talent, and uh, but they're cutting on him heavily. We're talking to Kurt Bull from the Houston Chronicle, and on Monday, Nick Saban made a lot of headlines, picking against the Crimson Tide, but really giving a lot of flowers to his two former assistant coaches, Steve Sarkeesian and Georgia, picking them to be in the SEC championship. Was Nick Saban just giving Alabama extra motivation, <laughs> or was it more, okay, these are my assistants and they might be the best team? What did you make of his pick, picking Texas and Georgia for the SEC championship? Now, I, I can't see the – Maybe the guy that made a living talking about rat poison is, is giving some rat poison. I don't know. But I think he's such a, you know, insightful guy. I think he really believes it. Sure. And, and, of course, nobody knows better than Nick Saban isn't there anymore than Nick Saban. So he knows what he brings. And I don't expect a huge drop-off at Alabama at all. Caden DeVore is an outstanding coach. But they, they're going to lose a little bit of that mystique until Caden DeVore proves he can win at the same level Nick Saban. But. You know, on paper, you know, I think you can make the argument those are the best two teams right up there with Ole Miss and maybe Missouri. When we were out in Austin two seasons ago, Alabama and Georgia, now Georgia gets to go out to Austin. Right. Really, talk about the Texas uh, baby fan base and the great games that are going to be coming to Austin. Well, they're salivating over the chance to bring in a Georgia and a Florida, uh, a Kentucky this year. So they've got a very favorable schedule. They only have – three true road games uh, in the SEC at Arkansas, at A&M, and at Vanderbilt. So that's a, a very favorable schedule for them. But it's, you know, it's over 100,000, but they're not known as rabid, livid uh, fans like at Death Valley or a place like Ohio State or even Georgia. So I, I think they need to get up to speed to – to match the uh, volume and the decibel level of SEC fans. One more question for Kirk Bullis on the Houston Chronicle. We talked about the Red River rivalry, but really there's another rivalry that gets added back to the schedule. <laughs> Texas A&M, Thanksgiving week. I think that's one that people aren't really uh, – isn't on as many people's radars, but no. maybe just as heated. What's the Texas feel getting them back on the schedule after, what, about a dozen years? Yeah, since 2011, and Texas had a walk-off win on Justin Tucker's – final field goal and, and they haven't forgotten that so uh yeah that's going to be you know just as hostile place as i've ever seen and when texas hired the a m baseball coach just a month ago that only rationed it up i cannot wait for it i love the uh, okay texas a&m thinks they're not little brother maybe they are <laughs> this that and the other it's going to be a fun season in the sec kirk thanks so much for your time hey thanks Jim. i appreciate it That's Kirk Bowles joining, who joined us out in Dallas, and I really appreciate him taking the time. Uh, it was a couple of minutes before Texas was set to go on stage. So we heard from Kirk Bowles, and we heard from Ryan Chapman today from our conversations out in Dallas. We want to thank everybody who watched the Joe Gaither Show on Bama Central today. You watched us on the Bama Central YouTube channel. You watched us on my own YouTube channel, Facebook, and Twitter, or you listened to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or on Amazon. As we get out of here for the day, we want to tell you once again, about our friends purple turtle roofing whether it is addressing leaks storm damage or general wear and tear purple turtle roofing is going to be there to deliver exceptional roof repair for your property call dustin foley and his team today at 877 pt roof 5 for your free roof inspection that's 877-787-6635 and make sure that you are prepared for any and all in life storms visit them online today at www dot roof turtle dot com we're gonna get out of here for the day we'll have another episode tomorrow right here on the joe gaither show on bama central and bama central dot com thanks for joining us on today's edition of the joe gaither show on bama central keep up with joe on all his social media pages at joe gaither six Subscribe, rate, and review the show on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, and be sure to read us daily at BamaCentral.com.